Welcome to the New Space India podcast, a bi-weekly talk show that exclusively captures insightful conversations with people contributing to advancement of space activities in India. The New Space India podcast is pleased to announce our association with Dassault Systems, a global leader in providing business and people with collaborative virtual environments to imagine sustainable innovations. Dassault Systems Solutions supports startups small and medium sized enterprises and original equipment manufacturers in developing disruptive solutions for space launchers and satellite propulsion recently a supply chain digitization study with dassault systems was conducted to provide a foundational understanding of the supplier landscape in the indian space ecosystem please use the link in the description to download the public white paper of the results of this study which will also give you a perspective on how ready indian suppliers are to enter the global space market sir welcome to this episode of the new space india podcast thank you you have uh, been involved with the space program for quite a long time and you have been observing the space program after you have uh, you know officially left it uh, of course for a long time as well in that sense you know you have an arc that is quite long in in your experience and then post your retirement uh, keeping up with the space program itself so in this episode of the new space india podcast i wanted to get your thoughts on the solid propellant development in india and uh, how it's evolved over the last 50 years or so in that sense before we do that can you talk a little bit about your own entrance into the space program and how that occurred uh, thank you for having me I think I passed out uh, of MIT in uh, 1966. Then, um, as part of the program, uh, we had to undergo six months of uh, industry practice or in- internship. So I joined NAL. Uh, while in NAL, I sort of applied for a post in NAL. My idea was to stay in Bangalore and work in NAL if possible. But that bureaucratic this one, it never came through. And in the meanwhile, uh, I got a call from. Uh, against an earlier post which I had applied to the space science and technology center as they used to call it SSTC uh, for uh, the post of technical assistant in propulsion i came for the interview and uh, one more uh, colleague of mine came both of us i think both of us were selected as one and two unfortunately they had only one vacancy so they took me in so i started my career in uh, SSTC those days it was the fledgling years for propellant this one we had one election elective in the in MIT on our rockets so we had some sort of an idea with regard to what are solid propellants and what are liquid propellants so they are made and uh, properties how to calculate the performance some some sort of a little bit of background was there but it was really exciting and those days a little bit in the newspaper also used to come with regard to the test director in terms watch the launch of our nike apache and things like that so it's quite fascinating Uh, I've always had interest in uh, looking at aero aerospace. Originally, it was aeronautics. That's what made me take up this line and study it. And then, okay, when opportunity came here before aeronautics into space itself, I jumped at it. So that's how I joined uh, this one at that time. I was uh, I joined with the person Prakash was quite a pioneer in uh, solid rocket work those days in Thumba. Did all sort of. Uh, things which I think as we proceed in the beginning and all that maybe we'll lay, I'll explain a little bit further and uh, this was the pledging years and uh, we working in uh, SSTC i think we were about yeah, around 30 people that's about all the average age was around 25 or so maybe and uh, dr sarabhai had sort of given sort of a lot of independence for people to work come out with ideas and thoughts of that variety so the people slightly older people who had joined ahead of me like mutna egam uh, all these people every time they would be bubbling with ideas what can we do next what can we show to sarabhai as when he comes on his next visit so a lot of ideas were being fostered around a lot of studies were being done and it was quite exciting to be part of a team where things are just developing also gave me good exposure to some of the sounding rockets that were coming in there to so have a look at it not really study but then uh, try to look at the brochures that are available Uh, american there was nobody from america who had come on this rocket but the french people had come couple of times so it was nice to understand what they did so uh, 
when they were assembling the Dragon rocket here, for example. So we had the Nike Apache, which uh, I could see and see it has uh, the two stages of it. Uh, we had the Judy Dart and we had the Centaur. These were the three rockets that were being launched from there. In the rocket assembly building, these uh, rockets would be assembled. It was quite a, technology was not really the most this one, but it was evolving. So it was quite exciting to understand how this goes. Right, and when you joined um, you know, SSTC, how many people together were present and was the recruitment, you know, very fast in that sense where people getting recruited, you know, left, right and center so that the scaling up would happen? No, at the time it was still very, very in the formative years. Recruitment was fast, but then not many numbers were not being recruited. I think after I joined, I think for the next uh, two years, hardly anybody did. Our major recruitment happened only in the 70s when the things had been I'll say post towards the end of Sarabhai's uh, uh, tenure in the 70s and things like that. When he gave a definition for the SLB project, then only the recruitment started. Till then, I think we were not very many. As I said, I was about the 30th or this one after that. There were a few steady inflow from the Bach training school. I think two more batches of people joined. Open recruitment was not very many as far as depending on the work content and all that. I think they were uh, not really projecting very many. But as the program evolved into SLB, I think the recruitment started up. And when you joined, of course, um, what was the focus of uh, the program itself? Was it, uh, you know, realization of these uh, sounding rockets or what was the overarching goal in that sense? There's one beauty of it, I think. They were perhaps told saying that we would like to do things indigenously, develop sounding rockets towards that end. But there was no defined uh, goal as to say, all right, by this time you have to make a rocket program or capable of taking so much payload to this type of altitude. What had happened was um, people with uh, background in uh, mechanical engineering, materials, uh, I would say propulsion by itself was not there, but mechanical engineering sort of covered it. Electronics. Some of these people were actually uh, brought, interviewed them in the Indian Embassy. I think in one or two interviews, maybe Professor Dhawan also participated. And uh, they came and settled down in uh, Trivandrum. And they were given a sort of free this one. You need to learn the technology. You need to develop. So as a recruit in the Institute of uh, Space, Aerospace Sciences, ISAS, Tokyo. And Dr. Sarabhai had a, uh, he knew one Professor Itokawa, Hideo Itokawa very well. And he arranged uh, with Professor Itokawa for all these people to have a brief training. The training period varied from 10 weeks to about uh, 16 weeks. That was the period. So some people, Prakash, for example, went and learned how to make the rockets propulsion part of it. Uh, Vasugam went, Vasugam was there and he looked at the control guidance uh, element. I think Dr. Gupta also looked at the avionics part of it. Mukherjee learned something on materials. Muthunayagam also had some opening on the propulsion and performance of uh, this one. So these people went through that type of an orientation and they said, all you start now developing, you give ideas what exactly you can develop. And I think only towards uh, uh, sometime around the April, May, 1967, Sarabhai, when he would come, I mean, all the engineers in Tri uh, Trivandrum at that time were called uh, Rohini engineers. So the, he would have a consultative committee meeting with the Rohini engineers. So in one of these meetings, he created uh, RS-75 Mark I and RS-75 Mark II. The idea was, again, no specs per set, uh, rocket, 75 millimeters in diameter, which should fly. And uh, perhaps his idea was competition will produce some conflicts, but it also will bring out some good ideas and success. So he created these two teams with uh, Dr. Y.J. Rao to lead the Mark I team and M.C. Mathur to lead the Mark II team. So both teams are uh, independent. Uh, separately, they were so required to produce the, uh, not produce, just design, develop, make the rocket motor the hardware for it, the propellant for it, the ignition system, nozzle on, all the things. The aerodynamics part of it is so common. The, they didn't divide the aerodynamic group into two people, uh, two sets. And uh, this is how it started. 
I was part of the Mark One team, and uh, whereas Mark Two went about developing the indigenous propellant, and uh, obviously, naturally, it took a longer time to develop the indigenous this one because we used to have, have tests, we used to fail, we didn't have very many theoretical uh, measures as well as the experimental measurement schemes available. Whereas the Mark One team, I had a colleague by name Sri Ram, whose father used to. Uh, used to work for the ordnance factories. And Sri Ram Gay Factory in Urban Kardu makes double base propellants by the solventless this one. And when when we inquired, we found they had one uh, chordate grain of 67 millimeters diameter and 550 millimeters long. Uh, we did a little bit of work and found when we, you can uh, design something with this 67 and 75, RS 75 are quite close. So we said we'll procure those uh, propellant grains from Arun Kadu so that we don't spend time and uh, we can go ahead on that one. But then if it is a race, maybe this is a faster way to uh, win it. So we didn't develop, we didn't really rely too much on the facilities available in Trivandrum or in this one. So the rocket motor was an extruded aluminum tube from uh, supplied by the Indian Aluminum Company. I think we had to pay for a die to get this uh, diameter. So they gave with a certain, uh, I think, 2 mm uh, wall thickness, they extruded the tubes and gave it to us. Only hitch was we had to order a minimum quantity of one ton, one ton of tubes so that they could uh, divert some sort of drug production to us. Uh, we had also, we had to order two tons. Uh, and uh, we made the rocket motor was 1100 millimeters and we learned how to bond two pieces of cord. Right? We could sort of dissolve the surface and put some pressure and apply it. So, so this was the totally indigenous effort on this side, where this other team started making the indigenous propellant. So they were uh, they took a longer time. By then, I think Sarabhai had passed away. No, he passed away later. I think when they flew the Mark II, also I think Sarabhai was alive. Sixty nine, they managed to fly it. The Mark One team managed to fly it in uh, sixty seven November itself. Right, you said something very interesting in the recruitment drive about you know Indian embassy being used to conduct interviews and perhaps perhaps even Professor Satish Dhawan being there. What was the motivation for a lot of these uh, young people who were abroad to come back then? I don't know about all the people. I'm not a good Mutraigam said uh, I mean to the end also you would say that I have a lot of regard for uh, uh, Professor R. Krabai. One man helped me help me go abroad, the other man brought me back. So I think many people wanted to get back to India for some reason or the other. And when they got an opportunity, saw the opportunity that it, they can contribute in an organization just freshly started, following the government norms, but not being a government uh, establishment. And Sarabha's personal personality, charm, and the way he could win people over, perhaps they this one end. I feel he would have said, I'll give you an opportunity to work in the development of as such within the country. So that they saw the challenge, they saw the attractiveness. One, one good thing about uh, SSTC those days, we followed the government rules, but we were a society. Okay, Part of the, we were being funded by the PRL, we are a granting aid institution of the PRL, we were working as a society. So Things were very easy in terms of this one. I think if I remember most proposals and all this discussed with Sarabhai, if you agree somewhere, you would initial and one of the administrative officers will see that it gets and the funding comes and the implementation happens and all that. It was very quite rather informal and fast that way. So most probably I think the personality of Sarabhai, the challenge he sort of posed to them, indigenously you'll be doing things which others have already mastered and you'll be catching with them, the sort of technology challenges. And independence, which is sort of indicated in this up and uh, new and upcoming field, perhaps interested people to come back. The competition aspect is also quite interesting. That particular aspect of having two teams compete, I think, um, was that the first and the last experiment within ISRO uh -huh. or what were the learnings from there? Learnings, they were both positive and negative, but let me come to that. Uh, this was perhaps not the only competition, but even in SLV, we had many places. Uh, development of two alternate systems going on, saying that at a particular time, we'll take a decision. You develop both systems at a particular time, we could take a decision. 
So, for example, uh, when we were working, there were three teams developing propellant in the in BSSC or SSTC, if you want to call it. Muthunayam had one team. We, we, we were developing something. The Kalam was developing another thing. Gavarikar was developing. And we also had RPP, which had the license production of the Centaur uh, propellant. They were also just one. So they were sort of not announced as a project, but there was competition was being sort of encouraged. So the pluses were we had number of uh, options available when you wanted to choose a system, which is good, which is bad, which is better improvement and all that. The negative aspect at times was uh, too much competition with very limited resources. Uh, people tended to perhaps to be slightly more uh, not so open, if I may use the word. And uh, there were at times uh, when you got into a project like SLV and all that sort of thing with multiple agencies saying that I can do it, I can do it. The management had a difficult job to where exactly to assign. And this got sort of streamlined only a little much later, I should say. Even in SLV, where this one, I can, I think as we proceed along, I can explain uh, this in the sense uh, how Dr. Kalam managed this sort of disparate, this one uh, capabilities that had been developed. You talked about this realization of the solid propellant. What is the timeline like? Like the first, let's say, five years that you were at SSTC, you know. Can you talk a little bit about the realization of the solid propellant and then the, the Rohini series of the rockets? As I said, the 75 gave a certain amount of cordite uh, propellant uh, capability. And in terms of uh, developing rocket technology using this, which we put it to use much later here and there, was development of rocket, an RH-125 and a second stage on it. So this was one project proposal of that variety which came in. I think another group came in with an RH 100, 100 mm diameter, they'll make this one. And all sort of incremental uh, improvements, if I can use the word, but they were still working on double base. Uh, we learned a few tricks, if I may use the word. The French, when they came with uh, their Dragon uh, rocket to fly from uh, India, we discussed, we found they were uh, using same PVC based propellant on which the Centaur technology had been uh, licensed, licensed to India, but they had added, started adding, adding aluminum to it to increase its energy. So the people in RPP got an idea, why don't we also make add this propellant, add the energetic and improve the specific impulse of the propellant. So this is one area they started. One end application for this very useful end application at the time when we started was Air Force wanted a rocket assisted takeoff unit for shortening the runway distance for both HF-24 Marut as well as for the uh, Sukhoi-7 uh, aircraft which the Indian Air Force had. So we, this is quite a development challenge in terms of uh, the motor had a one diameter towards uh, the top one third toward the head end and the rest of the system was uh, slightly larger, about 360 millimeters in diameter. It had to have a nozzle which had to be canted so that the thrust axis passes more or less through the CG of the aircraft. And it had to have safety features because the pilot is also involved. We don't want to have an explosion there. So this was a challenging requirement which we put forth. And uh, team from propulsion division, from RPP, uh, who else? I think mainly from these two and Kalam, the rocket engineering division. So we were uh, sort of involved in the development. Dr. Kalam was the project leader and his rocket engineering. Dr. Kalam was a, he would not miss an opportunity to push a new technology forward. So at that time they had developed the, they were doing development on the fiberglass uh, capabilities, composites, mainly for the nose cones. So he saw this opportunity so even though it didn't result in a major weight saving, he said, we will make the rocket motor case for the RATO unit also out of fiberglass. So, but so in the end, finally filament winding a cylindrical motor case, that is a new technology that got developed. We could develop all it. How do we, the people in RPP made a mold 
which could make the propellant in these two dimensions. That is the head end part was slightly lower in diameter, half end of 360, this one. We made something with a canted nozzle with a cast aluminum, this one. Degree was another trick in the sense as the aircraft nose lifts off, this nozzle should not scrape the ground. So the ground clearance was also a requirement. We incorporated two high pressure rupture discs in the aft end. So that in case there's an overpressure, that will be the safety release. It will release the pressure. So this was one uh, nice development, I'll say. Other thing was the uh, Atlantic Research Corporation. They had a sounding rocket called Arcus. So the Arcus rocket had come for, to be flown from Thumba. So when we looked at it, it had silver wire embedded in uh, the silver wire was supposed to increase the burn rate and increase the thrust. Otherwise, the end burning grain is not a very high thrust, uh, this one as compared to radial grains. So this Dr. Kalam started working with the RPP as well as this one. How do we embed the wires, increase the burn rate, and then on one of his Menaka rockets, he was trying to use this. This was another technology which came up. We didn't really take it forward, but then it did come. Other thing was essentially in the development of the, this one. And the indigenous effort was the sounding rockets, the PVC system can we now modify, increase the energetics and maybe make it case bonded. The PVC propellant occurs at about 175 degrees. So it's not suitable for bonding into the case. It has to be cast separately in a, what we call a PVC restricted tube and then charged into the motor, assembled into the motor adhesives and uh, things like that. So the indigenous effort was essentially therefore concentrating on this one. So two, one successful that came also the RH200, which is even being flown today also weather monitoring. So RH200 is a booster with a 125 millimeter rocket, which we developed as part of the, so that became an operational system. In the RH300 and uh, 560 series, Continuously change mostly with regard to the propellant and reducing the thickness of the case and things like that. We are still, still stuck there with the uh, metallic case. Though at, for a brief period, we modified the metallic case also with a new technique called the... And that means blade quality steel adhesively bonded, made into a cylinder and then charged. We had some good... We had a couple of lighters. Some of them were not so good because the adhesive was not capable of temperatures that came up during the flight. And they did, uh, we had a couple of failures. I think after that, the technology was given up. So on the propellant side, let me say, increasing the energetics, addition of propellant to an existing propellant that type of this one, incorporating the rate of unit was a third, this one. RA200, these were the success stories in the initial five years, which uh, we, uh, went through in the solid propellant area. At the same time, the people in PED who were charged with the making of the propellant, they were also looking at polyester-based propellant. Number of tests were done, number of uh, mishaps have occurred in terms no, no accidents, but essentially propulsion-wise, the system was not stable, the burning rate would uh, increase, the rockets would burst, but took quite some time to, uh, for them to stabilize. But they did stabilize, and finally, in I think November '69, the first introduced uh, propellant was flown. Must have flown about, about 10 kilometers or less. But that forms what he marks what you call the PED day. Even today, I think uh, those people very comfort, very com nicely uh, celebrate it even today. Of course, you know, with the development of all these uh, technologies for um, sounding rockets, once the framework and all, everything worked in unison and the success of the flights happened. Was there a plan put together to know what next? Because I'm guessing that all of this was um, inspired by Thumba and the atmospheric possibilities for the geomagnetic studies and everything else. So was there a, a follow-up plan as to what would happen once the sounding rocket technologies are established to you know, transition into this SLV kind of mode already put together you know, before the success of the first launch itself? This was a mostly a top-down approach in the early 
late 60s, early 70s, because Sadabai would come out with the, most of the requirements as such on sounding rockets and things like that. The bottom up was all that you present the management to Rohan and say, all it was, and that's what we do next. So in one of the Rohini consultative committee, the plans for a uh, satellite launch vehicle. I think the he just floated the balloon and uh, there were certain uh, studies done in uh, SSTC those days, one done by uh, some of the young Turks like us. Looking, the basic idea was given by Dr. Y.J. Rao and his team of a uh, uh, launch vehicle. And we sort of critiqued it in terms of, it was over ambitious, the type of impulse that you're planning unless the rocket motor also, case also burns, you'll not get that type of mass and things like that. Books that were available for uh, what you call conceptual design of satellite the mass ratios and things of that variety. And we critiqued it in the sense. So, so on one side, there was a requirement projected. We should start looking for the requirements of a satellite launch vehicle. A general study was done. It was open for debate. It was critiqued this one. And based on this critique, Dr. Sarabai asked all right now, this configuration perhaps is not adequate. You people start working some proper configurations. And he gave an indication saying that you'd like to put a 40 kilogram spacecraft into low Earth orbit. So the team in uh, led by aerodynamics uh, uh, head, Dr. Y.J. Rao, Janardhan Rao those days, started looking at uh, number of configurations which would put this type of this one. Sarabai was very clear saying that such a program will come through. So at the same time, he started sending a scout party to looking at what would be a launch station for this. Maybe I've talked about it with you, therefore I'll not repeat, but then how Sri Arikota was uh, chosen, selected, and all that was became part of it. They selected, studied you know, some sites. And uh, so a lot of things were happening. So SLV3 configuration where uh, after the configuration studies where this 40 kg satellite mass could be this one. And therefore that started the uh, development of the launch vehicle and its components. And here again, you're asking a question with regard to the competition. Sarabai's style of management perhaps still promoted this competition. I'm not very really sure if I look back in hindsight whether that would have been an ideal, this one too serve the realization of the way. This four-stage vehicle, even though we, this SLV-3, exactly followed, but then it took a lot of uh, uh, development aspects of the scout launch vehicle, the aspects, but solid rocket stages from in which we had some experience, liquid, we had not made very many, we had made some laboratory type of experiments, but then nothing much has been done. So for solid stages developed, and other associated technologies. And he created four independent teams for the uh, stages. One SLB-1 was led, uh, led by the first stage, was if I remember, uh, led by Dr. Gavadikar, I think. Second stage by Kurup, third stage by Muthunayagam, Kalam. So this is where the development went about for the, not just the motor, the total stage motor and more actuator system, whatever that is required, was given to four individuals. And the integration electronics, uh, just as an aside here, those days the fourth stage was configured around 560 millimeters diameter, if I remember. We had one uh, discussion with the CNES and CNES was connected in France. They were developing a launch vehicle called Diama 4B. And for the Diama 4B, they also wanted an apogee motor which is slightly larger than our SLV fourth stage motor. I think that was about 600 and odd millimeters in diameter. And Dr. Kalam jumped at the chance saying that we can develop, when we are developing our own motor, we'll increase the dimension to suit yours. It will sort of work for SLV, it will work for you also. So this was one, one uh, this once this development was over, this fourth stage motor also saw application as the apogee motor for the Apple spacecraft. So again, before it flew in a cell, it had already flown in Apple. This is a very, you know, just, but then I think there were a number of uh, 
technology challenges, how to use this one, and people, the way they conceived of things, of each of these things, it's itself in a story in itself, way to start. Of course, you know, in your book, you discuss about um, the early collaboration between uh, DRDO and ISRO in, in that sense. It's natural that, uh, you know, solid propellant, of course, is uh, of interest to defense organizations and of to the for the, to the military in rocket uh, development for weapons and so on so can you give a rundown on uh, how this uh, initial collaboration or the interest sparked and how it transitioned in the early days there were uh, I briefly talked about the rocket assisted takeoff unit the initiative was taken by i think those days it was group captain narayanan who became commodore and air marshal narayanan he was the one who met of Sarabai and then uh, and Kalam came out with the requirement. And uh, I think by the time development was over, but I think this was not as a DRDO as an organ forward for this type of requirement. It's individual labs as in when uh, the requirement came. So the aer aeronautical development establishment in Bangalore was, was developing what they call a pilotless target aircraft. That means a target to be released from an aircraft or to be tethered to an aircraft and then thus become the target for the other Air Force planes to hit. So this called for a quick boost. So the rocket motor should boost and this vehicle would be the target for the Air Force pilots. Uh, when we started, I think the work we, we looked at it this way, you require a quick boost we will use an end uh, audit grains that are available with us. We'll perhaps put them in a cluster and then use it for boosting because they would require only a two. And the RPP is PVC propellant as in an end burning configuration. We'll use it for the sustain. I think we went around it with a couple of tests. But at the same time, I think there was very naturally a demand from uh, the DRDO lab saying that when we can do it, why are you giving this job to ISRO? Because the Explosive Research and Development Lab, HEMRL could have, today is called, uh, or used to be called ERDL, Explosive Research and Development Lab in Pune. So they took up the project. They went with a different uh, concept. They used a composite propellant for the boost and a double base was a propellant to give the long sustainer. I think, as I said, at a particular time, both, both systems were ready. And uh, uh, I, I at that time suggested, okay, when you have both systems ready, there's no need for both of us to compete with each other. You use one system which suits your requirement. And if uh, very rightly your own lab is doing it, if they've done, if you're satisfied, we'll step up. We've got a lot of other work to do. So the PTA, this one went up. There was a lot of... Uh, other collaboration, which uh, I think Dr. Krishnamurti may know in terms of... Uh, they were setting up an extruded double bias uh, propellant plant. I think there are people helped a lot in terms of uh, specifying the equipment and uh, checking and inspecting the equipment. Uh, other thing was our people there again, indigenized much later. Many of the, many of the what you call the MIG uh, use a certain set of uh, adhesives. And I think at a particular time, uh, the Soviet Union or those days Soviet Union, said we are discontinuing with this uh, product line and the propellant engineering division indigenized many of those systems for the def defense. So much later, I think our people also worked on the canopy release systems for the HF24, uh, uh, even for the LCA, there was a collaboration to that extent. With defense, it's been individual labs asking for a particular type of capability that uh, ISRO had developed in this one. At some time, we have also taken the capability available in DRDL and then used it for a long time. I think on the ignition systems, the barium and things like that, they have supplied. Detonators used to come from there. And of course, we also developed the industry to take care of many of these things. But majorly, was these were the first two, this one. A collaboration. I think yes, your the Agni booster, for example, is based on the SLV first stage. So there have been some sort of a 
some element of both there of course you know in the 70s you had the nuclear tests and possibly an effect on collaboration that was uh, very prominent uh, with this row with uh, you know other countries and so on how much of that had a bearing on uh, you know technology development and did it change the arc in which uh, things were planned in terms of realization of certain technologies and systems uh, to the best of my knowledge it did not change it did not have any impact informally it was discussed here and there in terms of uh, whether this would fit in but i think formally nothing really happened nothing changed it was a civil organization with a mandate to do certain things and uh, it went on ahead with the same mission saying that we are we are a civilian uh, establishment our mandate is very clear so whatever development we do will meet our requirements or towards meeting our requirements that's our priority i don't think it had any impact on uh, on the new pokhran one or development activities per se none that i can think of no right and of course you know the scaling of the propellant plants and you know propellants themselves is a, is a very big challenge when you go from like the smaller to the bigger uh, rockets and so on so how this how does this you know scaling effect uh, been taken care of when you go from let's say rohini 75 to an slv or or so on so what are the challenges there and how was it really handled there was a very unique uh, type of uh, see by then okay as i said there were multiple teams of which were developing propellant so by the time we got seriously into the slv propellant scale uh, development i think uh, what was happening with the, uh, dr kalam's lab that got discontinued what was happening in dr muthunayam's lab using uh, natural rubber that got discontinued our uh, dependence uh, on uh, order this one was also much substantially reduced because even on the other this one we said we could substitute with the uh, our own propellant so the concentration therefore was what the propellant engineering division in vsc will develop how do we scale it up was one element of it and looking at the time element already you have based on the centaur technology certain propellant certain facilities you have already set up how do we go about using this so essentially what happened was in rpp because as i said did individual stage uh, project directors so each project director went about saying that whose propellant type of uh, horizon i see this development coming in and maybe there were other this one but essentially keeping this in mind everyone have what will come first so rpp had some facilities those facilities had to be augmented new facilities had to be required this one this space in thumbo was constrained but by then sprob uh, theory quota had already been land had been acquired so the major plant put up a requirement the solid propellant space boost to plant sprob capable of casting 10 tons of propellant which was the first stage propellant size okay the facilities of that order were created for casting curing radiography all the downstream operations required for a propellant system they have worked out uh at the samutunayam and uh, our team looked at it in the sense if you have a motor of that size producing a uh, this type of uh, thrust we should have a capability to test them so they came out with a big test stand this one like again we put those test stands in theory quota so and and our capabilities in trivandrum could be done some we had to go and do in theory quota group team looked at what is happening naturally it is natural to see what is happening elsewhere the so scout was using uh, some sort of a double base propellant for the booster modified uh, composite modified double base if i remember and maybe the pros and cons looking at it they said this not so useful for us and the shuttle was using what they call the pban propellant polybutadiene acrylonitrile 
as the binder. Uh, pretty say preceding this was the polybutyrate acryl or PBAA as they call it. So I think some initial experiments to be ported from uh, USA, then subsequently modified to PBA and, and looking at the tests, see, the, see RPP had all the infrastructure with regard to the uh, a control round as we call it, 200 millimeter uh, propylene grain, approximately 40 kg in mass, in which you could sort of quickly produce and test it and use the test properties to see all it, whether it meets the basic specs requirements in terms of ISP, burn rate, and things like that. Modify it if required at that scale, and then retest. So they start PBN and they came up with a certain process establishment at that scale. Okay, a test and the property determination of that scale. Now the expansion, they said, again, there were certain restrictions on the height. So they, with minimum modification, low cost, quickest way they found, they could cast a propellant one meter diameter, maybe about three meters long, 3.2 3 meters long, which will hold about three tons of propellant. So they decided, therefore, in consultation with the project team, with us and all that, it was decided the first stage will be made in three steps. One, so three segments would be cast and then assembled together to get the realize the first stage. So when you're making in three segments, you have to learn how exactly to trim it, how to inhibit it, how to assemble it. Those things came up. Whereas when these people in SPROB, as we call it, solid, uh, this theory quota, they said this is segmented and it's a nuisance. We will make it into a monolithic motor. One motor, which is almost 10 meters long, containing all this eight and odd tons of propellant. Okay, we'll make it at that stage and the development which they started essentially started with that. And uh, they said, you are looking at polybutadiene. We will look at something close to polybutadiene or giving a slightly better this one. See, they made what they call the isropolyol. That's a binder developed by them. And IPP10, IPP20 like that, they went on making the series and they said they would use that. And, uh, early 70s, uh, Dr. Gavarikar had a slightly very larger vision. He looked for the self-sufficiency, not only in uh, making a rocket motor, uh, this one, but also. So what he had done was he had started the propellant fuel complex, which would make most of the fuel components. So even if you develop something in the lab, you need to scale up. So he made a complex which has the necessary chemical reactors, the analytical sections and processors could be developed. So you had a facility which could therefore make this resin made in the lab, take it to scale it up and make it provided to sprawl for casting. Same way they had the ammonium perchlorate also, they took a license from, uh, they asked Karekudi, the Central Electrochemical Research Institute at Karekudi to develop a uh, decomposition process for us. So they made the process that was scaled up here to 600 amphibar uh, electrolytic, uh, this one. And then subsequently it was number of units, say cells were multiplied and set up a new plant in the ammonium perchlorate experiment plant as we call it in Alwe. So you had the perchlorate, you had the binder, other things could be got from market. So as long as you had the equipment, you had the wherewithal to really make it. In fact, this is, this has served as well. At a particular time, thinking that the APP made this one, we had also characteristic of the solid rocket community, which I'd like to emphasize here was, they have great pride in doing things by ourselves. Self-reliance was one major, this one. And uh, I am very proud in the sense, it's a total with no input from outside, outside the country, except the starting work on the Centaur technology, but uh, I think we are as good or if not better than many of the other countries in the world. So this is how it started with the this one. So on one side, we had the PBAN propellant serving on the first stage and second stage. The PED people started working on a CTPP based propellant. They could not make the exactly uh, CTPB as such. So what they did was they made a functional substitute for it, called it HF20. 
it was supposed to take rubber sort of uh, masculine masticulate it and then come back again so that made it. and it is a good propellant except for the mechanical properties would change a bit too fast if the, that gave us a little bit of problem in managing but uh, we knew how to manage i think okay so we if you make a motor you should test within a very short time specified time 6 months to 8 months so that it would still give a good performance beyond that it was giving a slightly uh departure from the normal performance it did not give into catastrophe but it gave us a departure from the normal performance so that's why i said when uh, kalam uh, started me this one so we had first stage propellant second stage propellant made by one agency third and fourth stage propellant made by sprob pd sprob combination igniters for the first stage and second stage supplied by propulsion division because we had also done something third and fourth stage will be supplied by the pyrotechnics division nozzle convergent and all that certain people we in uh, propulsion division we had minded how exactly to make it mold and uh, make the type of this one using any ablative material carbon silica we did in fact tried with asbestos also whereas as part of the centaur technology and the composites group had uh, developed some of the filament wire the tape winding technique for making realizing the nozzle divergent so then nozzle divergent went to the composites group the di convergent was given to the propulsion group integration and joining together again was given to propulsion group so divided responsibility but finally the end product came out quite well i should say beyond the propellant itself there's a lot of um, innovation that needs to happen in materials and you know things like uh, composites and other possibly other materials that are uh, there and often you know these uh, developments may happen outside of the traditional space sector some material being developed for some other applications in aerospace or other applications in that sense and may have been observed by some space uh, researchers or scientists to to bring in um you know most often let's say it is in today's case maybe something like carbon nanotubes or something like that that people are developing outside the space sector uh, generally as specialists and then people inside the space industry find an application and bring into this um are there any examples like that where uh, you know isro realized that uh, there is some piece of technology being developed in materials or so on in other parts of the country or other institutions in the country that isro would like to use in its uh, development of of rocketry unfortunately i think it was the other way around there was spin off from the space industry to the other uh, outsiders because uh, i think practically everything that we needed either we developed ourselves we made or made industry to develop for us we held in this one but i don't think i can't think of a situation where we got something was being developed elsewhere and we could adapt it we did fund certain uh, developments in other places for example in nl we uh, funded certain uh, composite uh, nozzle development we didn't use that technology but they tried something for us i to the best of my in this one i can't recall first stage uh, we had a lot of discussion of the first stage uh, motor case for pslv what are the candidate materials so one requirement was whether we can do just like d6 ac a weld free construction we didn't have the equipment in the country even if you put on uh, this one so after a lot of this one and whether 15 cdv6 should be scaled up or a go for a higher strength material like the maraging steel 250 and uh, i think we we went about saying that this is a requirement and finally brought in dmrl uh, to really scale it up to our requirement dmrl and then midani at the industrial scale up for example this one and because midani was involved midani also located uh, form you want to make the bin got to convert them into forgings and uh, this one they located a firm in germany for turning it to plates or sheets required to our thickness they work with our okela 
So the total concept in terms of a requirement property, this one, the round robin test for the weld uh, efficiency and uh, the crack uh, fatigue test as well as the crack, this one, all these things were really laid out by us. Now, if you ask, did somebody help? Yeah, we gave a certain lot of subcontracted work, for example, to the Electrochemical Research Institute at Karekudi. For, uh, uh, we gave some work there. For well development and things like that, we used capabilities in industry, capabilities available with the welding uh, research institution. So we used these capabilities, no doubt, but I don't think technology is developed elsewhere fed into our requirements. If I take the composites for the third stage, which you use for the motor case again, as I said, our uh, FRP division had already based on the SLV, the filament winding, this one, but they went on to develop a filament winding machine with also uh, polar winding capability as well as the hoop winding capability. These machines were developed in house. Much later, we did procure one which was, uh, had a CNC program and everything could be done in the same machine. But the capability was developed here. The numbers, unfortunately, were not so large that we could ask an industry to go ahead and take it up and produce at that time. So the industry was perhaps they would be looking at numbers. Those numbers had been not with this one. So in the ASLV, the fourth stage AS4, the modified uh, uh, SLV AS4 was modified. So that was the first time we changed over from S glass to Kevlar. So having got the experience with Kevlar, we used the same thing for PS. Uh, PSLV third stage also. We could have tried carbon fiber, but carbon fiber even today is not very much available. In Kevlar also we are continuing to import. We tried, for example, how do you make the fiber, this one. So the Kevlar polymer, comfortably our people could make, very conveniently the fire polymer could be made. Drawing into the filament was a bit of a problem. Not a bit of a problem, gave this one, but then I don't think we had the sustained uh, effort to continue with it. Uh, same thing with regard to carbon fabric, which we use in the nozzle for ablative. The silica fabric, which we again use as ablatives. These were de technologies developed here, passed on to industry for scaling up. And we buy from the industry. Only in some cases, we go up to the pilot level. In the carbon fabric, we didn't go to the pilot level. The industry said, we'll take up the pilot level study. You give us the basic technology, class of materials meeting the specifications. Even the HTPB resin, which we subsequently some developed in the lab, we passed on to industry to do it. At that time, it was uh, National Organic uh, Chemicals Limited, NOSIL. But subsequently, it may have other, other people have come in. Ammonium rate also, we have gone for expansion. So essentially, things have flown from VSSC, at least in the solid motor area, to industry. We have not really benefited any great extent from a uh, flow from a uh, development done elsewhere feeding into us. And the spin off from this is other users in the country, like uh, DRDO and other things, they've also benefited in the sense you also supply, supply the industry infrastructure available. Okay, so there are other people who can use it. How scalable is uh, the motor cases and, you know, the propellant, uh, you know, once you do the, the everything together, the testing and everything else, the, the infrastructure for the testing and everything else, what are the challenges uh, in, in scaling all of them when you go from, let's say, an SLV kind of a rocket to the GSLV kind of a rocket where the scale becomes very large in that sense? Um, are there effects in scaling that uh, you had to overcome or learn, uh, you know, in, in the time and uh, or is, is that scalability very, very easy? Uh, scalability is not very easy. It is scalable, but not uh, very easy. For example, uh, all the SLV state propellants, we did not do with HTPB. So it was a new animal as such. But the animal was a good animal in terms of in uh, PBN as well as HF20 the consistency of, the, of our mechanical properties could not be achieved. Energetic properties were okay, but mechanical properties, there was a wide dispersion. It would give us some, some level of problem. So this knowledge which you had developed with one class of binder resin, 
was not directly translatable to the other person. Second thing is, as happens in most of us, you plan for something and you tend to be also critical, subcritical in certain other aspects. Let me take in all the examples we had in RPP, the French were using for the PVC based propellants what they call Sigma mixers. So these are horizontal mixers with the blade more or less in the shape of a Sigma. So that was used for mixing, which was one ton, this one. And maybe PVC had long like this. Same sort of thing we reproduced originally in Sri Kota also. But when we started making the HTPB class of propellants, we realized we would prefer to have number one, one ton capacity would be too much. We would require to make a 30 ton segment. How many mixers? Second thing was therefore you need to go. Others also in US, for example, you're using the planetary mixers. So this planetary mixers, what they call, the Americans call it change can mixers. So the can where the propellant is really made that can be sort of attached or detached to the main equipment. So part of the main equipment, the can comes in, gets attached to this one. You add all the ingredients, mix it to this one, detach it, take it to the casting station. Okay, so unfortunately, in the initial stage, we ordered perhaps only four change cans. And therefore, if you therefore take the total process time, Mixing was to be about two, two and a half hours, or three hours, depending on what you're this one. From there, take it to the station and another one hour type of this one. So there was a problem with regard to the shelf life of these propellants. You need to cast it when the viscosity is still allows you to do the vacuum casting. And the viscosity with time starts building up. So it if you build up too fast, you have a problem. You have to waste a lot of things cleaning up. So these four, after these four were over, you have to do one by one and the time elapsed was much longer. So this gave us a little bit of flaws in the propellant grain. And this could be subsequently overcome only when we had more number of change cans available so that the casting could be done. So the experience of the SLV grains was not translatable at all in this larger size. Same sort of thing happens when you went to the nozzle, for example. Here we were using uh, similar techniques, but I think with the larger motor, with the casting, uh, what do you call the uh, uh, time available to you and all that. In initially, we ended up with a large number of flaws, which we had to correct. We had to take certain uh, actions for number one, correcting it. And the second thing was we had to salvage it because Carbon fabric, even at that time, it was almost 3,000 rupees a meter. And if you're going to keep away more than 10 lakhs worth of material just because you had others when you had some different. So scaling up nozzle was not easy. Igniters also from basket igniters where we're using only the powder and things like that. We now went to what you call pyrogen igniters where the rocket igniter itself is a small rocket motor. And the rocket motor igniter case had to be uh, consumable because we don't want something to melt, come out of the nozzle, damage part of the main grain and things of that variety because the igniter function is one, one minute maximum, 60 seconds. After that, if the dead hardware is hanging around, it will melt, it will come out sometime or the other. If it comes out, it should do no harm to the main grain. So that was also not scalable. And when we made the grain and segment for the free segment end had to be inhibited that gave certain water shedding and uh, small vibrations in the pressure and thrust time trace. So finally we could sort of uh, accept some of the it was not fortunately resonating with the main frequency so we managed to live with the frequency but it took us a long time to solve the problem. So many of these are not this one. Uh, another element is the burn rate also scales up with size because the thermal losses and other losses are different from one size to the other. So modeling this was a bit of an issue. And only when you start doing it, you start understanding a few other things. The process you employ has certain impact on the burn rates. So the burn rate gets augmented when you scale up. 
And that augmentation factor is dependent on the way you're casting the propellant, how you're spreading the this one. So there are a number of factors which could not be directly scaled up at all. And it was learning, as you see here, we got a plot. We did our experiment with this one. Some answers would be there. Some you learn only in the test, you find a difference. Then you break it. Other, other thing we used to have was as you say, when you don't know things, you tend to be conservative with the specification and the requirements. So I think we started with being conservative and then got more non-conformances that way. And we got more debate to find out why it is happening like this and correcting it. It was quite a useful learning period, yes. Just beyond the solid uh, propellants themselves, uh, ISRO, of course, you know, starts developing um, liquid propulsion systems as well beyond uh, solid propellants uh, and so on. So what I'm trying to understand here is, um, was this uh, particular transition from solid to then liquid, and today you have, you know, between solid and liquid, certain technologies in, in India, but certain areas of propulsion technology are very little developed. So it could be, let's say today, you have RF based propulsion, you have you know, field electric based propulsion, you have uh, water based propulsion, you have so many other new areas being today uh, up and coming. Have we kind of spread ourselves too thin by focusing on developing deep capabilities in legacy systems and, you know, we're not doing enough in very many new areas, including, you know, some of them even now to look, taking a look at very seriously at even nuclear propulsion in that sense, which we don't have any expertise in the country today. Uh, you, what you say is uh, to some extent true, but uh, things are changing now. I mean, I have not really gone deep into what's uh, currently the ISRO case status and capability, but then what has happened is with the new thrust on going more and more to industry, where the management of individual stages also is going to be left to the industry as such. You give me a flyable stage, that is the demand that ISRO is now putting. The ISRO manpower would be available now for looking, concentrating on some of these things. Keeping this in mind, I think if I look at, I think they're doing some work on semi-cryogenics now on, I think they are having already started some work on the micro propulsion requirements at uh, the spacecraft center here. So there is some thrust being put. I don't know the exact status because I'm not really been much involved in it, uh, but there is some thrust in the, this. The reliability requirements for the human space flight mission, whether they are They've got, we've got a new set of uh, boosters which are uh, going to uh, fly, which are powering the GSLV Mark III as well as the cryogenic, the larger cryogenic systems. So I think there's a good amount of mastery already available in that. That is happening very well. And uh, they are looking from uh, both environmental considerations as well as cons uh, cost considerations, starting looking at semi cryogenic. And I hope sometime or the other, because most of these people attend conferences and all that, the stress that is being placed on liquid methane, I am sure is not going this one. Somebody must be studying that also. Uh, Micropropulsion is something worthwhile really to look at, in, especially in these small satellites. I think they need to, they are already working on it. I hope they do it fast and do something. Also. And the human space flight mission itself has thrown certain uh, challenges. I understand they've already tested the that recovery capsule, what you call the emergency escape module have been has been tested. So I think the type of burn rate, the type of quick response that is required and all that, I think that's come out well. The reusable launch vehicle technologies, certain progress is made. So there is another this one. They're also on the hypersonic car. Uh, this one, they've had one test in ISRO. They've had one test in DRU also, I'm sure people get together, there are certain exchangeable ideas, materials, systems are similar. So I think there could be adaptation of this available, including test facilities. So future 
yes, I think there is more scope for both industry as well as uh, small labs to come up with ideas which uh, ISRO can adapt as well as ISRO will have now more free time because they are passing on the routine production to other agencies. Perhaps they'll have more free time to look at some of these uh, new developments that may be required. One part of your book, of course, talks about the integrated guided missile development uh, program and the motors uh, for that uh, and the missile complex themselves. So I'm assuming that there is um, a lot of the knowledge that originated from ISRO made the development of the IGMDP very quick uh, because of a lot of the technical challenges being solved, you know, through the SLV program and so on. Um, how easy was the adoption of a lot of those um, learnings, you know, while some of the people from ISRO moved to DRDO, including Dr. Kalam? I think that was uh, definitely a plus factor in creation of the systems. Initially, maybe as you say, for the Agni one, uh, maybe these things were helpful. But uh, when it came to the subsequent ones, say, I remember talking to Dr. Kala once, he said, uh, I was uh, saying missiles should be using solid propellants. So Why are you using a Prithvi as a second stage for the Agni one? And his answer was very clear. I have to do a particular job at the earliest and develop a vehicle which will give do what is needed in terms of range, in terms of the payload, in terms of the water that has to be carried and all that. And I look at it, there's one system almost readily available from ISRO, another system developed already in DRDO, both is available. Why not? So that made a perfect answer. So I think one plus aspect which I found in DRDO is the assimilation of these technologies which may have come from ISRO, conferences, people, as you said, as well as this one, has been very fast. And because their requirements are much more demanding in certain areas. For example, ISRO today, if I make a, within one year, I'll be flying it. I don't need a requirement to store it for five years, 10 years and things of that variety. In 10 years, there are certain property changes that happen. Your environmental conditions, either your casting in Sri quota, the temperature variations and all that are not very large as long as you can store this one. So the challenges in for a different system in terms of storage life, in terms of our service life, in terms of the environment they face, okay, in terms of the reliability you require is of a different order. So to this, much to the credit of DRDO, I think it's something which they have not only learned, they have in fact adapted, mastered, and improved on in many of these areas. Today, practically missile motor cases, motor cases are made of carbon fiber, okay, which is, we are aware as in ISRO, we are still doing with the metallic ones. So in terms of the inert mass control, they also have the flex. So they have mastered and they have done much gone ahead quite on their own uh, steam in many, many of the largest system realization. And uh, some of the products which I've looked at, maybe the experience with the others may have gained, but I think their own experience also is good because this one, the type of initial flaws we had in our systems, they are managed. So the processes they have developed or evolved are in some fashion, giving them an end product which is very readily usable without much repair, without much this one and uh, keeping it off. So there is uh, the evolution of, um, let's say all liquid stage rockets with uh, SpaceX and many others, you know, um, experimenting and proving with respect to the reusability and everything else uh, that has come up in the last uh, decade or so. Do you think that um, you know, in India, of course, uh, there's the reusable rockets and everything else is at the very early stage of um, design and development and not many things have been tested yet. But uh, in your opinion, do you think that, um, you know, solid propellant based 
rocketry will you know be something that will be in the military domain because of uh, let's say the very easy um, you know movement of those and being able to fly everything uh, from anywhere and so on against you know the civilians civilian rocketry and the more isro kind of rockets uh, you know will move towards reusability and 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 then you know basically move towards uh, all liquid so is that a future that you see or do you think that on the civilian domain there's still some applicability of you know solid propellants uh, as a person who has sort of uh, brought up uh, developed and used solid propellants i would not like the solid propellant uh, systems in isro to have a peaceful demise i'd like to see that they have a good application for some more years or many more years all said and done the type of thrust they can produce the speed with which they can produce okay and the cost at which they can produce i think are quite quite competitive and they still have a use for quite, quite some number of years uh you require them to boost some of these things and i don't think you can do away right now at least whatever i see immediately on the uh, isro's program sheet where you can totally now in terms of the cost yeah what uh, musk has done and all that yes towards the pillar access to a lower cost to access to uh, this one yes very much makes a lot of sense i was just looking at is no place for smaller satellite launch vehicles the answer is no if you have to launch 29 tons of payload does everybody have a 29 ton of payload ready at any given time or we like our uh, share taxis whether if you make a such a capability you'll have to wait for payloads to come to you to make up for the mass so there will be place for smaller vehicles for smaller payloads whether small satellites which are now but as coming in this one so which will still call for solid rockets which are easily to doable can be done by industry or quite as reliable or if not more reliable there is still a market for it even in the civilian sector uh right in the sense we have to be unique to us in terms of any launch vehicle we do in the equatorial launch we have to recover the hardware the first stage hardware we don't want it to fall beyond the andaman south andaman sea If it goes beyond we sort of people have talked about it in the sense we'll have to go beyond so that we can carry a better this one but keep keep enough uh propellants on board so that after separation the spent stage is made to fly back and land in our area yeah maybe if you say instead of sinking into in the south and amansi i will recover has anybody worked out the cost of this wreck and i don't think it's going to be small i don't know the cost but then one is you are paying certain you have to bring it back and then recover it and use so again it's again in terms of what is the market you have market share you have how many this one at what cost will this become competitive needs to be worked out so right now i don't see the end of solid rockets in in isro it will be there for some more time i like the difference they will go for more energetic propellants the class 1.1 but there's been some thought of working on the greener propellants so that you would environmental pollution and all that you'll reduce uh there was some specific impulse energetics as well as the density with the greener propellants i am not kept tabs so over there but there is one uh, scope there the other scope in terms of development could also be purposes where more energetic like the class 1.1 propellant has certain uh improvement of uh, benefit in terms of the performance improvement i think there is scope for uh, looking at some of the energetic oxidizers if you can reduce the inert weights and net cost that will be fine one of the aspects uh, that many countries are looking at is this um, rapid response and rapid launch capability and we in india have of course the agni capability that can be used for the sslv the small satellite launch vehicle kind of um, launches that are possible I ministro mean, is of course developing its own sslv at the moment 
do you see an immediate opportunity to test the agni 5 with its um, satellite putting capabilities and you know that being used as a part of the defense space program to have an independent launch capability for the defense while it can own uh, you know build its own satellites and and also launch and operate its own in the near future technically yes but i don't know what the priorities are okay you know if you want to be ready with a certain number of missiles and things like that or whether you want to go in for making a launch vehicle yes uh, i think i had done some sort of a calculation yes agni 3 agni 5 can be modified to a satellite launch vehicle some capability should be there. but what is the extra that needs to be added whether they have the priority in mind or they have something else in mind too uh, all i can say is they have the wherewithal to reach orbital capability either using the present stages or if necessary developing this one because developing a new stage also is not difficult for them uh, many of the other technologies between missile technology and launch vehicle technology are similar okay the satellite part is something which they have to look at micro propulsion may be a necessity okay so but where overall where with all where overall capability is very much available with the drdo2 develop fly operate such a uh, such a launch vehicle yes right so i have taken up uh, you know an hour and a half already <laughs> your time in that sense it's been a <laughs> very quick and um, uh, kind of a very insightful conversation so i'm going to ask you let's say one last final question and let you go um what is it that you think uh, will happen with let's say the solid propellant technology in the next if you can go to the 10 or 20 year horizon that's a tough question i really yeah really they have not thought about it uh, one is in terms of what is currently happening i think everything every system has a life for a few more years so next 10 years i'm sure i think if i look at the horizon around what SLV plans to do, or uh, what uh, ISRO plans to do, or DRDO plans to do, I think there is definitely a great horizon available. Beyond ten years, one is I think there are more more energy that should be made available, which on which some work is going on, especially uh, for DRDO. But then I think it's been rather slow. People have talked about it, and if I look at the class one point one propellant uh, being employed. already in the us missile systems probably the russian missile systems too we have not come up to that level i think so 1.1 class where almost a 10% type of improvement is possible is one this one same we've been talking about some of the other uh, energetic trick oxidizers and all that for quite some time that has not also not really so i think we need to put thrust on that the nep class of propellants on one side then uh, Uh, this what uh, other energetic uh, oxidizers which are available i think we need to do some some faster action on the plus side already i think in terms of achieving high burn rates and high pressures drd has made some good progress but it is still falling in my opinion slightly short of what you require so if you can slightly work towards an improvement or uh, in the burn rate that will be one this one a third issue which has come with some of the air launched missiles and things like that has been a combustion instability problem because on one side the services require a non smoke plume that means the plume exhaust should not be seen that means no aluminum addition lack of aluminum addition automatically gives you a instability related issue so how do we overcome this to some extent solutions have been found but in a long run more research and how exactly do we achieve high burning fast reaction rockets propellants without the instability issue is something this one so some steps have been taken with the advanced propulsion centers at iit chennai at iit madras and things uh iit mumbai also or bombay but 
I feel a better focus on the problems, all the issues. Somebody starts looking at it much more seriously. There is applications out there. So next 20 years, I'd like to see more energetic propellants, maybe more greener propellants coming into scope. This what I, this one, but in larger system, what exactly is this one? I have not really paid much attention to that. Yeah, hopefully, you know, this is something to, to follow up for the next uh, years and see where it goes. And I'm sure that um, your conversation that we recorded will act as a guiding force to a lot of them who are you know, looking at these in the coming years uh, to develop their career in uh, the realm of propulsion overall. Again, I thank you very much for taking the time to recording this conversation. This was uh, very insightful. I will, of course, uh, refer the listeners to check out the book on um, evolution of solid propellant rockets in India published by you. And I'm asking that that particular literature will actually complement this conversation very, very well. So I hope you know uh, you keep uh, advancing this uh, area a little bit more and uh, possibly also write something down, uh, something more non-technical in nature of more, uh, uh, you know, more of anecdotal or, or even personal insight into some of this, because uh, I'm sure that, you know, there's a lot of uh, insights that will come out of even the non-technical nature of uh, insights uh, and even anecdotal nature of insights that uh, is based on your experience that people can learn. So I, I do hope that um, you'll take some time in, uh, in putting that out. I think that will be very insightful for all of us. And it will definitely complement some of the technical insights that has gone into that piece of literature out there. Again, thank you very much for taking the time. Thank you very much. I enjoyed talking with you. I'll keep what you said in mind with regard to the anecdotal one. Yes, maybe something to supplement it. Only one word of caution. This uh, book has been published by DRDO Desidoc. They are not the best uh, people to market it. It's quite a job for people to get a copy, but ask them to go ahead and try. Right. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed talking to you.